because I love the suttas so much because the Buddha is my teacher. So I want to understand what he said and how we can apply um, everything we learn about the Dhamma and make sure we can check it out, um, not against the Buddha's teachings, but kind of in line with the Buddha's teachings to clarify our own understanding. And uh, it's actually from the Buddha that I got this concept in the first place of the soft mind, because he's actually speaking in this particular sutta directly about that. And it gives us a little bit more of a clue, not only how we start to soften the mind, and in this case, purify the mind of what we call the impurities of either bodily conduct, verbal conduct, mental conduct, so our sila, our virtue, and also the hindrances to meditation, to deep meditation in particular. So he's talking about that in more detail, but he also talks about the result of softening the mind, the kind of mind that comes out of deep samadhi states, deep states of, in this sort of unification, deep states of stillness and tranquility. And then the mind is truly soft. He said, then it's really fit to work. You know, it can be put to any task and it will accomplish that with ease. So that's when the mind is malleable, when it's um, unbiased when it's um, what are the other words he uses unbiased and fit for work so we'll read the little sutta it's only short and uh, and then we can look at it in terms of what we can learn from this because I think there's quite a lot of wisdom to mine in this little sutta so this is from the Anguttara Nikaya which are the books of uh, well it's called the numerical discourses but it basically organizes the suttas into the books of ones, twos, threes, etc. So this is in the book of threes and it's sutta number 101 called the soil remover. <coughs> and here the Buddha is addressing the monastic community. But I'll just replace the word monks, which also includes none, with the word community. <laughs> okay, so it's even more inclusive as it should be. So community, there are these gross defilements of gold, soil, grit, and gravel. Now the soil remover or his apprentice or her apprentice or their apprentice first pours the gold into a trough and washes, rinses, and cleans it. When that has been removed and eliminated, there still remain middle-sized defilements in the gold fine grit and coarse sand. The soil remover or their apprentice washes, rinses and cleans it again. When that has been removed and eliminated, there still remain subtle defilements in the gold, fine sand and black dust. So the soil remover or their apprentice washes, rinses and cleans it again. When that has been removed and eliminated, only grains of gold remain. The goldsmith or their apprentice now pours the gold into a melting pot and fans it, melts it, and smelts it. In other words, we're now softening the gold. But even when this has been done, the gold is not yet settled and the dross has not yet been entirely removed. The gold is not yet malleable, wieldy and luminous, but still brittle and not properly fit for work. But as the goldsmith or their apprentice continues to fan, melt and smelt the gold, a time comes when the gold is settled and the dross has been entirely removed so that the gold becomes malleable, wieldy and luminous, pliant and properly fit for work. Then, whatever kind of ornament the goldsmith wishes to make from it, whether a bracelet, earrings, a necklace, or a golden garment, they can achieve their purpose. So that's the simile, and now we hear what it relates to. So too, community, when a person is devoted to the higher mind, and that is adichitta in Pali, which is basically a reference to the jhana states, so the higher states of human experience, they're actually called uttari manusadhamma, which means beyond human experience. So it's actually a very lofty states of mind that take us out of the five sense world. So when one is devoted to the higher mind, there are in that person 
gross defilements. So this is like the first two, right? The coarse uh, impurities of gold. Bodily, verbal, and mental misconduct. So that's our lack of virtue. An earnest, capable person abandons, dispels, terminates, and obliterates them. When this has been done, there remain in that person middling defilements, sensual thoughts, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of harming. An earnest, capable person abandons, dispels, terminates, and obliterates them. When this has been done, there remain in them subtle defilements. So this is an interesting one. Thoughts about their relations, thoughts about their country, and thoughts about their reputation. An earnest, capable person abandons, dispels, and terminates and obliterates them. When this has been done, there remain thoughts connected with the Dhamma. So that's the middle so-called defilements, even thoughts connected with the Dhamma. And then the Buddha says that kind of Samadhi, here the translation is concentration, but um, if you know my teachings, which are very heavily influenced by Ajahn Brahm, I don't like the word Samadhi, uh, sorry, I don't like the word uh, concentration, because it sounds very narrow and contracted, and in my experience, the more the mind settles, the wider, the softer, the more expansive it becomes, so I think stillness is a much nicer translation of Samadhi. <clears throat> So there comes a time when the mind becomes internally steady, composed, unified, and stilled. That stillness or that samadhi is peaceful and sublime. Oh, sorry, I've missed a piece here. Uh, so after the middle defilements have been removed, there still remain thoughts connected with the Dhamma. Yeah, are we following or have I confused you? Yeah, so there's still thoughts connected with the Dhamma. So that stillness is not peaceful and sublime, not gained by full tranquilization, not attained to unification, but is reined in and checked by forcefully suppressing the defilements. So yes, I'll restrain my commenting for now. But there comes a time when one's mind becomes internally steady, composed, unified and stilled. That, constant, that stillness is peaceful and sublime, gained by full tranquilization and attained to unification. It is not reined in and checked by forcefully suppressing the defilements. Then there being a suitable basis, one is capable of realizing any state realizable by direct knowledge towards which one might incline their mind. So this is the point when the mind is truly malleable, wieldy, luminous, tranquilized. And I also love this word pliant because pliant is actually the word for soft. It's mudu in Pali, and that means soft. And then we can make any kind of ornament the goldsmith wishes to make. And in this sort of, it goes through various directions that we can put that soft mind and the soft mind will just follow because there's no more vested interest anymore. It's removed, it's been purified from the five hindrances that have vested interests. So whether one wants to experience psychic powers or divine ear, divine eye, past lives, et cetera, et cetera. Come back, born and reborn due to their deeds. These are all maybe a little bit too incomprehensible for us, but the most important thing here is that one can also turn the mind towards the Four Noble Truths and basically overcome the roots of those defilements. So uproot that greed, hate, and delusion. Hate is a strong word, but let's call it wanting aversion and delusion from the mind once and for all. And of course, with that complete removal of those root causes of suffering, um, the mind is completely soft. These things can never arise again. And when delusion is removed, there's no possibility for the hindrances that make the mind so hard and brittle in the first place to arise again. So this is quite a deep sutta. Um, and there's many things we can understand. Sometimes the insights are, are quite simple as well. And uh, 
The first thing I would really like to draw your attention to here is that initially we start by identifying what those impurities of the mind are. What are those things in our minds that make it hard? And here the Buddha is saying that the, the coarsest of those things are our bodily, verbal and mental misconduct, right? So straight away, he's drawing attention to the first stage of the training, which is sila, ethics, virtue, as a foundation for the rest of the practice. And it's not only about reining in any unwholesome deeds of body, speech, or mind, it's also about practicing their opposites. So the restraint, the reining in, even forcible suppression, if you like, which may sometimes have to happen, is called varita sila, which means kind of like restraint. But then there's also charita sila, which means um, action, which means actively doing good deeds of body, speech, and mind, such as being generous or giving service, um, supporting charities, um, working in the health service, the education service, transport, whatever service you work in, really relating to that with a positive mind and seeing it as an opportunity to bring some happiness into people's lives as far as you possibly can. And in that way, whatever we do becomes part of the path and part of this preliminary process of softening the mind. So of course we can also um, condition our mind, you know, the mental deeds in really wholesome ways and use our minds in ways that recollects uh, upon the people in our lives with positive uh, perceptions rather than honing in on their faults. The same for ourselves, right? And then using speech in ways that's not only truthful, but also brings about harmony, brings about trust between people, divides, sorry, brings together those people who are divided. This is one of the Buddha's descriptions of right speech. It actually heals the rifts and creates a harmony, not only in your individual relationships, but in community at large. You know, things like sharing the meal that we did today. Even if you were eating alone, it was like in a shared space, which I thought was very beautiful and organic and natural. And these things start to give rise to a really firm basis for the practice. And then the next uh, level was at the level of thought and intention. So the abstaining from the wrong ways of uh, thinking, and that's literally defined as thoughts of cruelty, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of um, desire, sensuality. And the opposite of those three is identical with the second factor of the noble path, the uh, right intention, or if you like, right thought, right motivation of the mind, which is the opposite, non-cruelty, which can mean gentleness, compassion, non-violence towards ourself, uh, loving kindness, the opposite of ill will, yeah? having thoughts of loving kindness towards ourself and all beings. And then the opposite of the sense desire is actually what's called nekama, which means renunciation. And that is a kind of letting go, a kind of uh, relinquishing of ownership, not controlling our experience, not controlling other people, but actually letting things be. So these are all uh, ways to purify our mind at the next level. And then the part about uh, thoughts connected with one's family or one's country, one's reputation, are quite interesting because they're all about what we consider an aspect of me and mine, yeah? the sphere of the self. We own our body or whatever, we own our mind. We, not only that, we think we own our friends, we think we own our reputation, and that's obviously so fickle, right? Uh, one minute you can be like respected as somebody enlightened and beyond reproach in the case of some teachers. And then the next minute you ordain bhikkhunis <laughs> and suddenly you're expelled from your community, you know. So it's very fickle. That's what happened to my teacher. Um, but that's okay by him because he followed his heart and he did what was ethically correct. And I think because of that, he has no regrets and a great deal of uh, spiritual integrity. And that gives strength, that gives softness to the mind. So all of these things are also connected with the five sense world. You know, they're all thinking about our relationship in this world, to the world, to one another, to ourselves, etc. We're not yet out of, of that realm. 
And then at the next level, it's the thoughts about the Dhamma, which are, of course, a lot more subtle and wholesome. And there's a whole other sutta that talks about thoughts connected with the Dhamma as being not harmful to the mind. This is in the uh, sutta called the two types of thought. But the Buddha says that even though they're not harmful and you could think thoughts of loving kindness for a whole day and night without any problem at all, you'd only be making good karma. Still, eventually that thinking will tire the mind, tire the body, and as a result, you'll find that stillness is far away. So eventually we have to sort of still the mind to the degree that the, the conceptual thought starts to fade away, but what is left is the emotion, the feeling, the disposition, if you like, of that loving kindness itself. So as we go deeper into this, those thoughts about the Dhamma start to turn into a direct experience as we allow the mind to settle and still. And uh, gradually also when that happiness arises from having wholesome thoughts, it kind of takes over the mind. So we don't need, it, it's a kind of antidote to the restlessness. We actually want to be where we are and we can allow ourselves to just sink more deeply into the moment without wandering off in this way and that way, you know, trying to make sense of the world through the mind, through the conceptual mind. So that's the first stage here. But also I think one of the things that speaks to me really strongly in this is that, uh, you know, even at that time, it might be possible to um, have some kind of stillness, some kind of samadhi, but it's not yet peaceful and sublime. It's not fully tranquil or unified, but there's some force in there. And this to me speaks about the right approach to meditation as being very gentle and soft because using force will only get us so far and quite often we reach a dead end because there's still that sense of self involved. There's still this kind of feeling that we need to be there doing something. We need to hold on. And it's actually that that prevents the, the meditation deepening naturally. We're still owning our practice. We're still owning our meditation. And, we, and it's difficult to take the next step. So this whole process, it is a process and it's one that takes time. You know, so this speaks of the importance of patience, persistence too, but patient persistence, you know, where we gradually, gradually clean the mind and clean it again and clean it again and keep kind of working on those subtler things that cause us suffering. You know, at first it's very obvious things like anger, for example, might arise in the mind and anger is something very coarse that we can easily be aware of. Unfortunately, most of the time when we say we're aware of anger, we're actually aware of the object of the anger and that keeps on striking the mind. But anger can be experienced directly quite easily in the body. You know, Generally, you might find that the heart starts to kind of speed a little bit or there might be some redness that kind of feels quite hot in the face or in the neck. Um, I remember once approaching somebody who was visibly angry and um, as I spoke to actually try and explain my perspective, I could see this redness just creep up her neck. <laughs> and I could see this anger. And then gradually as we spoke, and as I sort of said, you know, maybe it wasn't quite how you see, saw it. And actually my intention was good. It kind of all subsided. And we ended up having a cup of tea and having a chat and everybody apologizing for whatever their part in it was. It was really sweet, but I could see that constriction, you know, and that heat in that person's body. And of course, in oneself, it's easy to experience anger and the results of anger, which are usually to feel pretty exhausted and also pretty remorseful afterwards. <laughs> so the loving kindness, of course, is a remedy for that. Um, so in the beginning, we start off by purifying our mind from the coarser levels of defilements. I don't quite like the word defilement. It's an unfortunate English translation. I prefer something like afflictive emotions or something like that, because whenever we sort of use terms like bad, good, even wholesome, unwholesome, it can sometimes create a sense of like stigmatizing one kind of feeling and elevating another. And actually, I think the Buddha is much more concerned with suffering and the end of suffering. So whether it's harming you or not, not whether it's bad or good, but you know, you can know for yourself whether something's harmful or beneficial, and you can know that by its effect on others as well. 
So let's call them afflictive emotions or afflictive states of mind. It takes time. And I love that that's, um, you know, stated so clearly here where the Buddha says that the next step is that there comes a time when one's mind becomes internally steady, composed, unified and stilled. There comes a time. And this is when it's not through force or suppression, but it comes as a natural result of a process that's, you know, begun a long time ago, perhaps, you know, and it's been an ongoing process with a lot of skill, with a lot of patience, and it's not reined in and checked by forcefully suppressing the afflictive mental states. And then it says, there being a suitable basis, one is capable of realizing any state directly realizable by direct knowledge towards which one might incline one's mind. So at this stage, the mind is truly soft. We've worked through so many of the hindrances to that deep stillness. We've worked with anger, we've worked with craving. And these things get subtler the further we proceed. You know, craving doesn't mean necessarily intense desire or lust. You know, as monastics, I mean, at least for myself, that's not really an issue at all. It's been a long time since I renounced those kind of things because for me, it felt very agitating, very um, unrestful and complicated. Uh, whereas the pleasure of just simple mindfulness, even before the mind gets still, is already preferable to that for me. Um, so these wantings can take much subtler forms in our meditation, such as, you know, being with the breath, but kind of wondering when it's going to start to settle or, you know, when it's going to maybe turn into a bright light in the mind or, you know, when it's going to give us the results we had last time. <laughs> it's just a subtle, not quite being satisfied with where we are. Basically a lack of contentment, right? And the same with the ill will in meditation, it's often just being a little bit bored or not quite um, fulfilled and therefore kind of looking for something else, looking just ahead of where we are or looking maybe back to where we used to be and would like to get back to. The two things kind of create restlessness, both that wanting and that ill will, that subtle ill will. The ill will can also manifest somewhat perversely in meditation through a sense of not quite feeling we deserve to be still, not quite feeling we really did enough work to experience joy in the practice. You know, maybe we think we're beginners and we're, you know, having a nice meditation and we think, oh, no, 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 this can't be right. You know, I haven't like really focused or, <laughs> or maybe we're really experienced meditators and we expect more. We expect to be in like states of bliss all the time. And these are all hindrances and they also carry that subtle sense of ill will to ourselves. Because again, you know, it's mis apprehending the path and, and the journey, which is not a product of, you know, what the self wants to attain. It's actually a result of letting go. And the more we're able to stand back and allow the process to unfold, in a sense, the easier it flows. Somebody who was staying with me last week in the Vihara had a nice simile as well for the soft mind. She said, it's the mind that can kind of flow like a river can flow with life well, rather than kind of, you know, things getting stuck on the riverbanks. And uh, we'd just been out to see the fields that are flooded just opposite um, Donington Bridge, Ifley Meadows, I think they're called. I've only just moved into Ifley, so I might get the names wrong, but um, it's a floodplain and the uh, waters had flooded there and frozen over quite thick ice. And some of the ice was kind of all broken up. And she said, it's like, if you throw a stick on the ice, you know, on that field, it just stays there because the ice is hard, so it doesn't flow on. But if you throw that stick into a river, it just washes by, it's gone. And I think this is also a really nice simile for kind of letting things be, letting things go. You know, it's not that they're not there, but you don't kind of get stuck, they don't get stuck to your mind because it's not contracting around the difficulties. It's actually letting them just come through and move on. And letting them teach us as well, you know, because we miss so much if we don't. The same person actually said that she'd suffered quite significant depression and anxiety in her life. 
And she said to me that, um, you know, sometimes these emotions are so difficult, you actually think that they're going to break you apart. You know, you can really be kind of at the very edge of your capacity of what you think you can endure. And at that time, fear can come up, of course, you know, and I've experienced that myself, having quite severe anxiety and thinking, gosh, maybe I'm actually dying, you know, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes the emotions that can arise can be very intense. And she said, but in the end, you know, I was able to open to those things and to work with them without pushing them away. And they didn't break me because my mind was soft. And I thought that was so lovely, you know, that ability to, to kind of carry on and carry on in an open-hearted way without closing down, but, you know, still trusting life, still trusting that, you know, this too will pass. And there'll be a time and, you know, that I'll bounce back and perhaps bounce back even more strongly than before. So we can work with these things in our meditation and, um, you know, and notice how subtle they can be. You know, usually it's the really subtle um, hindrances that stop us getting into that deep meditation. Just that very subtle kind of edging into the future because we're not really content with where we are. And one really beautiful way to be more content in the moment is to kind of give it value, you know, to recognize that this is the result of everything that's happened so far in my life. This is where I am. Um, there's some value to be found here. What can I learn? And just to really be open with that experience and kind of wait with it. So you're not waiting for it to change, but you're actually being there right with it as if you have all the time in the world. And this is also an expansive state, you know, patience allows you to just give things the time they need without any concern for them passing away or changing into something better, but just being present for the sake of it and being present with a really good attitude. And then of course, there's the dullness and drowsiness that we might experience in our meditation. And um, often that dullness and drowsiness is a result of resisting. Um, our present experience as well. Most of the time, especially on a short retreat like this, it's just tiredness, you know, <laughs> you've been exhausted from all the running around in the world. And I came in here today a little less exhausted than yesterday, but pretty exhausted actually from just full on days from the mo moment I wake until, you know, even after the evening meditation, sometimes I'm consumed with all the admin and organization of events and guest bookings and stuff at my little place and uh, I came in pretty tired but I kind of thought well it doesn't matter if I'm tired I can be open to that the theme's on a soft mind and then I allowed myself to feel actually a little bit energized not lifted by the people around so right now I'm not really feeling tired but even if I was I think it's okay you know it's not um, within my control whether I'm able to form a sentence or not. <laughs> That's always the fear, you know, for somebody who has to give a talk. It's like, will I be able to actually form a sentence that makes sense? <laughs> but, you know, somehow or other it works out. So, yeah, it's nice when we have that perception of being in this together, you know, and just allowing things to unfold. So the same thing in our practice, you know, we can allow ourselves to be a bit dull and a bit drowsy in the beginning and just trust that when the mind has had its rest, it'll wake up a bit brighter than before. So there's no need to fight these things, you know. They will just pass on their own. And then the doubt, which can be another big hindrance, is um, one that we can overcome by inspiring ourselves. I think that's the best thing to do. Like, you can bring up the faith mind if you have that, you know, if you're particularly um, um, committed to the practice. Maybe you have teachers who you really look up to or respect. Maybe the Buddha's teachings um, are something that speak to you directly, in which case the faith mind can become pretty huge. You know, you've got this incredible resource at your fingertips. And when we read a little bit more closely into the suttas and discuss them, we realize, wow, the Buddha was actually speaking to us. You know, it was so long ago in terms of our little time scale, And yet he's speaking to the human experience that remains as relevant now as it ever was. And um, it's so much concerned with our well being, with our welfare. You know, that's the only reason the Buddha taught. And um, 
you know, when we realized that and we realized that he wasn't teaching for no reason, he could see that there'd be people like us today who would benefit. And here we are having access to the teachings. It's just an incredible thing. You know, however far you think you may, however far on the path you may think you are, or, you know, what your prospects of going deeper in meditation are, you're hearing the Dhamma, you're like devoted to goodness, you're devoted to cultivating the mind in wholesome ways. And that's extraordinary. You know, if you think about what most of the world is tied up in and engrossed in, it's, you know, simply following greed and hate much of the time. So we can bring up that mind and we can reflect, you know, that suffering has a meaning, it's there to be understood. And, you know, the path is there for us to turn to at any time. You know, you've got this far and it's amazing. You know, even if this were the last day, <laughs> your last day of this life, which I hope it isn't, then, you know, you've spent your time really well. And I'm sure we could all die pretty satisfied. I hope so anyway. And if not, we have some more work to do <laughs> in our daily life. So then, uh, as I was saying, there's other things to get out of this sutta as well. And the one sentence I do want to um, draw your attention to briefly is the last one in these couple of paragraphs where the Buddha says, um, once we've come to that full tranquility and full softness, then there is a suitable basis from which realizing any state in other words really realizing the goal of the path so that suitable basis is actually the samadhi states themselves it's when the mind has been purified fully of these hindrances and we've done that not through force but through skillful means through skillful attitudes and perceptions and also that ability to let go and that means also letting go of this sense of self that wants to attain something. This is very important on the path. That the practice is really about giving and giving things away, giving our attachments, our fixedness, our rigidity away, being open and receptive to learning something new. And I think this is why at that time, you know, when we have experienced deep states of stillness where the mind's completely free from hindrances, we're actually open and receptive enough to see something that's maybe not what we expect to see. You know, because many of us, especially if we've been practicing for maybe decades, uh, maybe just, I don't know, a year, we might think we have some insight into things like impermanence, suffering and non-self, but they're only preliminary insights so long as we haven't overcome the hindrances and that's mainly because the sense of self is just too scared to see that deeper truth especially when the mind's not soft and sometimes I have experienced I mean I've been practicing now for 27 years pretty much as the central point of my life and I've experienced a, and met a lot of meditators I've served many many retreats and been in all kinds of different um, monasteries and retreat centers in Asia and the west and sometimes you do meet people who seem to get into deep meditation, but afterwards something goes wrong, you know, either their sealer, their virtue is really lacking. And there, I mean, there was one person I met who was even an alcoholic, but was claiming to get into these deep states. Um, and yeah, he was even aggressive towards his partner who I knew quite well. And it's like, how can a mind like that enter these things? They can't be the real thing, you know? So this is one thing. And, and just, you know, the fact that we may sometimes push a little bit too hard to kind of have certain experiences, I think has a lot to do with it. The mind's not actually ready. It doesn't have the foundation, but it's the same when insight arises. Sometimes we're too eager to kind of understand things like non-self or impermanence. and when we do have a glimpse it's a little bit of a shock and I think when we really make putting the causes in place the priority over the insight that we expect to have or the result we expect to have then the mind is very resourced it's very grounded it's very um, soft it's expansive and when those insights come to the mind they don't breakers we're actually ready because we have another resource 
we have the Dhamma as a resource, actually. We have states of love and kindness that we can tap into. And, and when those insights arise, we can respond also with that kind of love and compassion. I don't know if that makes sense. It's kind of subtle points in a way that are maybe a little bit intangible, but the point being really that I like this sutta because it does talk about the difference in, you know, practicing to um, remove these things uh, with force as opposed to allowing the mind to naturally follow a process um, of gradual, gradual working with defilements, working with impurities, if you like, in the mind with skill and with gentleness and with patience and allowing that time to come when the mind just softens and settles by itself. So I think that's enough for this afternoon. Um, and it would be nice to practice a little bit together. Um, I hope that that wasn't a little bit uh, too deep or a lot of information to retain. And if so, please just let it go. <laughs> because all of these teachings are meant to be guidelines for life, really. And, um, you know, little bits of it might speak to us at a particular time. And later on, something might pop up that you thought made no sense at that point or that you didn't even hear. And then it just comes to mind at the right time. So just let it go um, and let anything that's inspiring inspire the mind. So. I forgot to record. Did you record? Oh, cool. <laughs> okay. So. Please stretch and take your time again to find a comfortable posture. And just as any Dhamma reflection is just an offering, so too the meditation guidance is just an invitation. It's not something you have to follow or you have to kind of get right. It's just a, a guideline, something that may be helpful for you at this time. And if not, please feel free to practice in your own way. So with your eyes closed, if that's comfortable for you. Once again, greeting your body as it is now, as it manifests with its different feelings, sensations, maybe warmth or coolness.
maybe softness or hardness, tightness or looseness. Different characteristics of the four elements of which this body is composed. Simply aspects of nature, not me, not mine, not a self. But with a sense of respect that this body is your vehicle for practice. And the best you can do is be kind. However the body manifests, to you right now in your own mind's eye. Once again, developing that perception of looking at your body as though gazing upon a very dear child with tender concern for its welfare. Checking through the body gently in your own time to see if there's anything you can do to make it more comfortable, more at ease. Sometimes there's nothing we can do physically, but we can choose a different way of relating to what's in front of our mind. So if we take the paradigm, the perception of compassion, rather than pushing away anything that's painful or unpleasant from our mind. We gently lean in with eyes of tender concern. Perhaps acknowledging this is painful, this hurts. And just checking, what is it I can do to care for this moment? To care for this ache or pain? The tiredness perhaps that's in your body or mind? Perhaps some subtle anxiety lodged deep in your belly? or chest. See if you can tend to that with a caring, gentle disposition of a loving parent. Or if it's easier, a friend. Even a Buddha, if you have that kind of faith. How would a Buddha respond to suffering? How would a Buddha respond <clears throat> to well being and ease? No doubt, keeping an open heart to it all.
And if you wish, if it helps to direct the mind, to encourage the mind to respond with loving kindness or compassion, you may like to pop a couple of thoughts into the mind, directed thinking, such as, may I learn to care for this moment? Or may I be happy? May I be well? So use your own wisdom and discernment to work out what is helpful to you at this moment with this unique condition of your mind right now. If there's some aversion or ill will, then thoughts of loving kindness can be really helpful to bring a sense of uplift to the mind. If there's some restlessness in the mind, then maybe thoughts of contentment, like may I be content to be right where I am. And if you are using some skillful thought, make sure you listen to the resonance of that thought in your body, staying embodied always. As you drop that thought in the mind and listen deeply to where the mind inclines. And a soft, skillful mind is also a flexible mind that can adapt and adjust the meditation subject to the condition of the mind. So if you find your mind wandering, you may wish to return to a phrase, a gentle suggestion fairly regularly so that thought process is regular, consistent, and an anchor for the mind. If on the other hand, your mind is fairly tranquil and quiet, it may be enough to simply drop in a single word from time to time. like contentment
or loving kindness. A simple reminder to the mind. And then allow the mind to settle. Trust the mind to incline in the direction toward the meaning of those words. Always staying connected to your felt experience and noticing the effect of those thoughts on the body and mind. If you notice your mind nudging for results for a certain experience, just relax. Come back to meet this moment gently. With an attitude of embracing, accepting it just as it is.
And as these attitudes, perceptions of compassion and loving kindness help to settle and calm the mind, you may find the mind receiving the breath. If it's soft, In a soft and quiet, gentle mind, the breath easily soaks in. So if the breath does arise in your mind, just allow it to soak into the mind. So the mind can rest on the breath.
just as in a soft, receptive mind, there's no resistance to the breath. There's no resistance to the happiness, the peace that comes along with the breath. So allow that too to gently soak into the mind, however subtle and humble it may be.
So we're coming close to the end of this meditation period. How do you feel now? How did compassion, kindness help to soften the mind? So let's end the meditation by just once again wishing ourselves well. Sharing thoughts of loving kindness and compassion with ourselves for our own welfare and benefit. because this is a wise thing to do. The Buddha said that not only does compassion lead to great wisdom, compassion is one of the measures of that wisdom. So if one is truly wise, one will respond to the world in ways that heal the suffering, heal the pain. One will plan for the benefit and well being of all beings. This is the sign of great wisdom. <laughs> so may all beings be happy and well. May my practice be a source of happiness and comfort, true benefit for all beings, including myself. So please listen to the sound of the gong and on the end of the third ringing of the gong, you can gently open your eyes if you wish for some walking meditation. just to note that that last little um, sutta that I referenced was also in this book. It's the Anguttara 4, 
186 for those listening <laughs> here or on Zoom. And that's where the Buddha says that the mark of great wisdom is that one plans for the welfare of both oneself, others, and the whole world. And in this way, one is a person of great wisdom. So this is the best measure of uh, the depth of our practice, not the particular state we achieve. So should issue in compassion. This is the beauty of the path. So... We now have a period of walking meditation until about uh, 2.45. So we've gone a little bit over, um, but it gives you 20 minutes, probably enough on a cold day. Is that, is that good? Yeah? Gives you a chance to stretch and uh, get a bit of fresh air. And then we'll sit silently for half an hour. So you don't have to think too far ahead, but... Uh, after that, there will be tea, I just want to say. So unless you're really thirsty now, I suggest and recommend that we maintain the continuity and take your gradually softening mind into the walking posture. It can be really nice outside. I just walked a little bit back and forth from the tree to the edge of the grass. It's actually quite nice. It can be calming. So uh, is someone going to do a bell and say... Quarter to the hour. Yeah, wonderful. Great. So if you come back in about 20 minutes, we'll just sit silently at that time. Thank you.